Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Abel, for the invitation that uh, I accept uh, uh, as a symbolic one that goes much beyond uh, the individual, but uh, it reaches uh, all new scholars that are struggling to get in contact with uh, Picker. And then uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, concept of uh, frenetical aspiration. Uh, one of uh, the most distinguishing aspects of the phronimos, the person who acts according to practical wisdom, is to well deliberate. In this article, I wanted to explore what it means to deliberate after Hikar's little ethics as well as his reflections on narratives. In order to do so, I will suggest and investigate the reasonability and possible advantages of looking at deliberation as a form of narrative. This path of investigation may lead us to highlight the intrinsic relation between saying and doing in the context of deliberation. It may also shed light on the aspirational aspect of the Fronimo's activity that is constantly trying to extend narratives in order to tell an actual story that makes sense. He's elaborating narratives in order to propose and promote a common good life within just institu institutions. Uh, this investigation is therefore tied to the ethical axis uh, proposed by the organizers of this colloquium, and we expect to explore, at least on a high level, some of uh, Hikar's relations to the English-speaking contemporary philosophy as we take langu language as the reference for the unethical analysis through the mediation of meaningful actions. So uh, let me do a brief characterization of uh, the narrative deliberation. We are taking deliberation from the Aristotelian tradition, the Bouleusis, as uh, Hikar does in his Little Ethics. Nevertheless, in the context of this discussion that shall lean towards Hikar's relations to linguistic turn, we won't explore the depth in depth the points in which Hikar's appropriation departs from Aristotle's own usage of the word. We will basically keep the notion that deliberation is a practical, rational process, which is, a, is the basis for the phronimus to choose that line of action that he shall take or that he shall should suggest to be taken in practical situations in order to achieve the good life, in the sense of eudaimonia. There are two preliminary remarks that uh, shall be done on top of this general conceptualization, though. Uh, the first one is that along with Ricoeur and McIntyre, we shall also emphasize the political or institutional aspect of deliberation. The Phronimus deliberates not only what's good for himself, but also what actions and course of events are most likely to bring a good life for persons involved on the actions that will spring from his deliberated decision. We shall also highlight with Gael Fias that one of the key factors for Hikur's attention to phronesis is its strict bound to individual situations and persons, which is directly related to his attention to authority of others involved in the deliberation. The second preliminary conceptual clarification is that we will use the concept of phronetical narrative as an extension of Hikur's broader studies on narrative to inquire a possible ethical applicability of narratives to deliberation. It's well known that Hikur recognized the ethical dimensions of narrative. I, I quote Hikur, narrative is uh, not denuded of every normative, evaluative, and prescriptive dim dimensions. And as a configured action, it is never ethically neutral for it imposes on the reader a vision of the world which implicitly or explicitly <coughs> induces a new evaluation of the world as, and of the reader as well." End of quote. Therefore, in a certain sense, every narrative is already an ethical one. Nevertheless, with the qualification phronetical, we want to emphasize the specific usage of narratives in the context of an ethical deliberation guided by phronesis. Assuming these uh, rough definitions, I would like to suggest a simple and initially naive model in which we assume that deliberation always takes place at a given moment in time that we could uh, call point B of uh, phronetical narrative. 
that has its, its start on point A. The liberation is required because at point B, the, uh, something is still senseless, and there is a need for the liberating the next steps that will lead to a frenetical narrative to a point C in the future. Typically, if not always, the frenetical narrative from A to B is not concordant. It does not make sense. There is a need to propose a frenetical narrative from B to C that may restore or create a concordant discordance between A and C in such a way that everyone involved in the frenetical narrative may have a good life from point C onwards. We may then, then take the deliberation moment, the point B, as the considered present of the frenetical narrative. The narr narrated time between A and B in the, is the past being considered through a retrospective narrative. And the narrated time between B and C is the future that uh, we could call the perspective narrative. Let us uh, go through some examples that may help to clarify in which sense we shall take these concepts. Firstly, we could think of a quarrel between two young siblings in which the mother is called upon to moderate and propose a solution. Secondly, we could think about a person who needs to decide whether or not to accept a job opportunity that may interfere in his personal life and search for advice of a senior co-worker. Thirdly, we could consider a judge that shall promote a verdict on a legal trial. trial. And finally, we could uh, consider the president of a medical committee that shall conduct the deliberation process and propose a line of action regarding the medical treatment and procedure to be applied to a given patient. In all of these cases, there is a time of deliberation and decision, the point B, the moment to accept or not the job, the moment in which the mother intervenes in the quarrel uh, to propose a solution, when the judge promulgates the sentence, and the moment in which the medical committee has to meet and take a decision. In each of these cases, they are looking back and trying to put events, actions, conflicting stories together. It may be a personal or professional feeling or a partial view of an issue provided by each brother or claims of accusation and defense attorneys along with applicable laws in a trial or the medical, personal and family history of a certain patient. In each of these cases, the deliberative process shall, took back, shall look backwards in time until a point in which the story's threads shall begin to be considered. That great temporal reference is what we are calling the point A of the frenetical narrative. Each of these paradigmatic situations also projects a future condition, a point in the future in which a certain chain of actions may lead to a bright professional situation with these or that personal achievements, two young adu adults living together in harmony with these or that ethical traces, a certain individual integrating to a peaceful community, or also the end of a suffering medical condition. Underlying all these perspective views, there is the intent of a good life that projects a point in the future in which the extended frenetical narrative promotes the transformation of a senseless story at point B to an integrated discordant concordance at point C. And to conclude this example consideration, we should uh, recognize that the frenetical deliberation is in most cases, if not always, linked to a conflictual situation, which seems aligned with Ricoeur as he puts the, an emphasis on deliberation and discussion emerging from conflicts rather than suspicious and potentially harmful established consensus. As such, deliberation shall always be considered as an open process. We shall see, even if there is a moment when the decision is uttered, the deliberative task of the phronimus is not ended, and as it remains committed to follow up on the flow of actions, is started as a result from his decision taken. It will also invite us to reveal this initial temporal framework with fixed temporal marks to a much more fluid and constantly evolving deliberative process. Let's talk a little bit about this look at the past uh, in the retrospective narrative, which is the first part of the frenetical narrative. 
When the Phronimus looks back from point B to A, he's basically trying to configure a retrospective narrative with two main characteristics. First, it shall be as complete as possible. Second, it shall be as close as possible to what actually happened, which is obviously a very complicated epistemological issue that stretches itself far beyond the boundaries of this article. Making sense of a set of actions and events that may span through a long period of time is not a simple task. The duration between A and B may impose a real challenge to the Fronius capability of creating a retrospective narrative. But it's not only the temporal distance from A and B that the Phronimus has to face. He also needs to narrate a story that takes into account the maximum number of possible points of view and events from A to B. This amount of parallel threads of the frenetical narrative that shall be considered and put together in the final intrigue is what we could call the narrative density. The narrative density is therefore the sum of voices and points of view that are entangled in the narrative. The more they are considered and coherent, coherently correlated, the more comprehensive the retrospective narrative tends to become. Considering the multiple threads of the frenetical narrative and finding its touching points demand a kind of multidimensional competence that is typical of the frenetical intelligence. Couldn't we approach this task of the Phronimus of listening, searching for his stories, putting together new angles of the to the second moment of mimesis? Isn't the configuration an exercise in which the author configures the narrative of a whole by entangling many parallel narrative threads? Aren't there similar traces between this phase of deliberation and mimesis too, such as a vivid interest for others' narrative that imposes the creation of a fictional or historical narrative, a certain empathy with others that seems crucial to foster the inquirer, the patience to go through the details and possible alternate intentions and motivations of a long description. On the other hand, there are certainly some important differences between the configuration moment when one is writing a fictional or historical text and the gathering of narratives to understand the entanglement of facts and events during a deliberation. The first one is that in case of fiction, the spectrum of possibilities is almost endless, and there are no, no factual constraints to narratives being told. The second one is the time period be, uh, available for analyzing the set of narratives. While the reading and writing activity tends to be something that is not extremely timely constrained, that can be interrupted for a deeper thought, that can be intertwined with other activities, deliberation is, in many cases, a much more intense activity and timely constraint. <coughs> the third one is the emotional aspect of both activities. While reading and writing is normally a task performed on a calm environment and with not much external emotional pressure, deliberation is very often related to stressful environments agitated contenders, a lot of institutional pressure. The fourth and possibly the most challenging difference is that while the fictional and historical narratives are mainly directly related to texts, deliberation is typically related to decisions about actions that are directly related to actual lives. But do these differences invalidate the proposed approximation between Mimesis II and deliberation? The fact that fictional fiction uh, narratives are not constrained by some events and actions that might indeed have happened should not be an unsurmountable problem. As Ricard mentioned, fiction narrative is a kind of laboratory for thought experiments, for exploring what could be. There is an affinity with deliberation both in the object and in the procedure, as well as the procedure. And if we take historical narratives, then we would be moving closer to the intent of the liberation, in which besides the entanglement itself, there is a will to take the narrative as close as possible to actual events and actions, following what Hikar would call paradigms of implotment. Nevertheless, as Kearney highlights, Hikar is right to impose the ethical limit of responsible actions to the power of narrative imagination applied to deliberation. There is no poetic license to actions in the ethical world, and that's an important consideration that shall point towards other characteristics 
of the frenetical deliberation. Regarding the timing constraints of deliberation comparing to the act of reading a narrative, it really seems to be a difference due to the specificity of both activities. Nevertheless, it does not seem to invalidate the approximation as the essence of the mimetic moment seems to be the same. It springs from uh, the prefiguration of antecedent actions that takes form as a narrative configuration. What's really different is the speed in which these two moments have to happen, in the case of deliberation. This difference only highlights another aspect of the frenetical decision. The phronimus is capable of working through these mimetic moments with an agility that may not be common to everyone. There is also a need for a very delicate and situational balance to determine when to stop considering the narrative threads. So the decision is not deferred to a point in which the prospective narrative is compromised due to the analytical delay. The challenge is to, to search for a good golden mean, in Aristotelian terms, an optimal point of balance between the completeness of the retrospective narrative and the urgency of action. I believe the same applies to the third difference, the emotional pressure the, of deliberating comparing to composing a narrative. The traces, the traces of the mimetic activities are preserved even if there is a new emotional component that may not be present in other forms of narrative. It also highlights another characteristics of, characteristic of the frenetical deliberation. It is able to compose, it's supposed to be able to compose um, and put together many narratives, many times very dramatic ones, with the mind clarity similar to a right that is doing his writing at the solicitude of his office or his studio. Regarding the fourth objection, the gap between the textual na nature of historical and fictional narratives and the often known textual nature of the liberation, the suggestion is that the Phronimus can be recognized exactly because he is able to read the narrative threads and put them together in a new composed phonetical narrative as if he was reading and writing an instant historical narrative. This suggestion most likely conducted our memories to recurse discussions on the differences between written texts and spoken discourses. Besides the important relation between texts and meaningful actions, we shall also recall, for the sake of this argument, his comments about the unique characteristics of a written discourse. Ricoeur suggests four main distinctions between the spoken and written discourses in the model of the texts. The most important to, be, to the issue at hand seems to be what he calls the non-extensive references of the written text. I quote Hecker, this referential function of written texts exceeds the mere ostensive designation of the situation common to both a speaker and hearer in the dialogical situation. If we turn for this, a second to Mimesis 1 as a necessary step towards Mimesis 2, it means that the Phronimus shall always look for a new potential non-ostensive reference of texts and actions in order to apply them in his future deliberation. It's a kind of a frenetical attentiveness that tries to capture these non-ostensive references during the life experiences. This is related to the Phronimus formation process, but this discussion shall be deferred to a later moment. These brief and initial arguments may only allow us, at least for now, to not consider as unthinkable a uh, rapprochement between mimesis and phonetical deliberation. But we shall take a step back a, a little and, and uh, take another look at the deliberation process. Since its first proposition form, it was always thought as a process involving a particular case and a basic principle that would guide the deliberation. It seems that the previous arguments were focused on the particular case, on the frenetical narrative of specific conflictual situations that needs to be solved. But how to integrate those principles into the proposed relation between phronesis and mimesis? Hicker's approach to this question has been discussed by Peter Kemp on his 
on a broader scope of the ethical narratives in several of his <coughs> studies, but especially in his great article, Element pour une éthique narrative. Mm. We shall limit ourselves to the frenetic deliberation itself. Firstly, we shall say a word about what can be taken as a general principle. For the Greeks, the relation between ethics and metaphysics provided the universal truth for the practical syllogisms that could be grasped by the phronemus using the right reasoning, the orthos logos. But it's, a, it's certainly an issue to the contemporary thinking, and it may be one of the most important contributions of Hikur to the ethical discussion. Hikur's practical philosophy suggests that the ethical principles shall be taken from the interpersonal and institutional values that are constantly being imposed and reworked within a given ethical community, creating what he calls universes in context or potential or inchoative universes. So, in this sense, his thinking gets closer to McIntyre's proposal when he integrates the notion of standards of excellence into his little ethics. But also, Picker integrates the Kantian practical reasoning as a necessary moment of his ethical reflection, offering another source to the discussion of the principles considering the practical judgment. The liberation show, therefore, take into consideration these principles that are either in the form of rational laws or juridical laws or traditional ethical values within a community constituted that constitutes the source for the practical judgment along with the grasping of particular situations at hand. With respect to the ethical values within the institutions and the communities, we shall once again look at Mimesis' process applied to the Phronimus as he comprehends these values, either, uh, sorry, as he comprehends this value either from founding ethical texts or through his communitarian experiences and refigures himself in a way that makes him a proper representative and the liberator of those values in the form of, of refigured convictions. The phronimus is the one able to refigure itself with the community ethos, and that provides him ability to exemplary deliberate consistently, consistently to the community ethos. That's the point in which mimesis and traditions get together in the transmission of ethical principles. And behaviors that are sedimented in oral and written tradition and that are expected to refigure the lives of those participating in the community. The movement from the world of text to the world of action was also extremely well captured by Brian Trenner in his article in Plotting Virtue, Narrative and the Good Life. He suggests that the refiguration moment can happen when oneself reads the actions of the Phronimus and put them in perspective with his own life. Trainer already also highlights that the refiguration model is not a simply copy of, and the, this characteristic is also applicable to the tradition of practical wisdom. Becoming a Phronimus is not copying others' actions as frenetical action have always to be taken into account agent's conditions, not only the objective situation alone. Refiguration is not about copying actions, but rethinking about one's own action, taking another existential horizon as reference. Furthermore, the refiguration, as su suggested by Hikur, not only helps understanding the major premise, the universal in Aristotelian terms, but also how the liberation takes place on the ik et nunc situation. The phronimus is capable of knowing the particular and put it together with the ethical standards because he's able to gradually refigure his views of the matter based on the retrospective narrative that tries to capture the particular situation. This refiguration is in a certain sense a continuous effort to recognize oneself as another, oneself as the others implied by the retrospective narrative that are striving for a good life in order to achieve that a good deliberation shall be made. Regarding the juridical law, Ricard discussed this extensively on his works about justice, 
one crucial lesson from those reflections is that there shall be an intrinsic tie between the juridical laws and the ideal for a good life, between the legal and the good. If uh, we follow this suggestion and we abstract the various complications involved in the passage from the ideal of the common good life to the juridical laws and procedures, we could also suggest the same kind of mimetic appropriation of the phronemos via the constant refiguration in face of the legal institutions that shall represent a form of living, a good life in community. And finally, the Kantian deontological approach can be integrated in the phonetical narrative process in a similar way as he integrates it into his little ethics. It's a test for the ethical aim of the phonetical narrative. In this sense, it works as a limit to the possible configurations of the phonetical narrative. Deliberation is not any kind of narrative, as it cannot say anything but it shall propose a prospective narrative that is guided by the aim at good life, which can be subverted by the egoism and violence, and therefore has to pass through the deontological moment. So the phronemus has not only to compose the phronetical narrative about what has happened in the conflictual situation at hand, but he has also to know the, and indeed represent the ideal narrative for that ethical community in order to well deliberate. It involves a deep pre-understanding of the word of action, a capacity of, to constantly refigure oneself based on reading not only written narratives, but also lived narratives in order to comprehend, actualize, and ex expand the ethical dimension of those sources and configure an implotment that encompasses the several narrative threads of the particular question in view of the prospective moment which, in which the decision shall be proposed in the form of a prospective narrative. So let's talk a, a little bit about this second moment of the prospective narrative. Let us now move to the, uh, the focus of our analysis from the phonetical narrative past to the future, from, from the analysis of uh, the points between A and B to B and C, from the retrospective narrative to the perspective narrative. Uh, George Taylor, in an article presented uh, in, at uh, the Rio conference in 2011, explored Hicker's concept of perspective identity as developed on lectures on ideology and utopia and also on his lectures on imagination. Perspective identity is part of a community or individual identity that highlights the possibility of changing the current narrative identity of individuals and communities to face new challenges and demands brought by ever-changing social, cultural, and economical situations. Ricoeur adds that, I quote him, what we call ourselves is also what we expect and yet what we are not, end of quote. Taylor suggests that, quote him, there is an aspirational side to prospective identity, a sense of what we are not yet and are striving for beyond our current boundaries. There is a need for productive imagination in order to transform existing identities. Productive imagination can involve the creation of new models, whether through new encounters with an existing tradition that reinvigorate and transpose it, or through new encounters with other existing or proposed models of governance that allow transpositions as well. End of quote. The second moment of deliberation seems deeply related to this perspective dimension of the narrative identity. It's focused not on what was, but what can be. The focus changes from an attempt to properly grasp the actions and events that led to the current situation by putting together as many narratives as possible to the task of proposing an extension to the existing frenetical narrative that can promote a good life for the ones involved in that mythos. Nevertheless, the mark of extension is not a mere, a mere continuity with the retrospective narrative. It can be a, a rupture with it. But even being a rupture, it's a rupture that takes into account the retrospective narrative. 
Another fundamental aspect of Hikar's work related to the theme of perspective identity is uh, that it involves the productive imagination to create a new possible symbolic order that is able to open new possibilities to the current narratives. Actually, the productive imagination is also operative in the retrospective narrative. There is an intense work of productive imagination, as Hikar hi highlights, to create new sense, uh, to entangle different events, actions, intentions, even in the past. In his essay, Imagination in Discourse and Action, Ricoeur says that there is no, I quote no action without imagination. He highlights three main levels in which imagination grounds actions. First one is project, second motivation, and the third is power to act. The perspective narrative is in a certain sense, the narrative and project intertwined in a mutual exchange of the structuring and anticipating schemata. It seems plausible to argue that productive imagination is a distinctive, is distinctive capacity of the Phronimus to figure out new narratives, proposals from the retrospective narratives that are typically presented as aphorias. In the context of frenetical deliberation, it seems also possible to reflect about the role of productive imagination on the mimetic circle itself. The discordant concordance from point A to C may and many times must encompass a rupture in uh, new encounters that were part of the preferential choice on point B by means of the productive imagination of the phronimus applied to the deliberation. The model of narrative is rich as it allows to highlight the possible rupture on point B that is integrated and promotes sense in a broader entanglement of facts from points A to C. The Phronimus has, therefore, the task of finding possible continuations for the retrospective narrative at the point B by using the productive imagination to suggest a, re a perspective narrative. The narrative perspective allows to clearly envision the two sides of the liberation that may turn into an extremely complex task. On the one hand, the liberation always is steam from the retrospective narrative, which is anchored on the realm of what it is. On the other hand, it cannot simply derive the decision from the two premises of a possible practical syllogism or any kind of logical procedure, as it demands creative and imaginative solutions to face the tragic of action. It shall propose the interconnection between what happened and what can happen given what happened. A good deliberation not only adds a segment to the current narrative, but actually coherently and consistently extends the narrative to turn it into a good concordant, concordant, discordance concordance as the frenetical narrative progresses. We could, again, approach deliberation by taking Mimesis II narrative configuration as our referential. The major difference is in the perspective moment is that the phronimus will not be trying to capture narratives and threads of narratives, but he will be exercising possible continuations to the current narratives. This approach helps to grasp important aspects of the liberation as the epistemological and the poetical ones. Both of them shall exist along with the ethical aim, which shall remain the basis of a good deliberation. Complexity is a challenge also to the perspective narrative as there are many potentially there as there are potentially an infinite number of possible variations to extend the frenetical narrative. The perspective narrative should then think through as many alternate threads as possible and its implications to the individuals and to the community involved as at the end what really matters is that each thread is tied to people's lives. From the strict epistemological point of view, this multidimensional aspect of putting things together is actually an ability typical to other forms of practical intelligence. For instance, the chess player becomes a good chess player not only because he masters the possible movements of each piece on a board, but because he's able to think about the large amount of possible movements he and his opponents are likely to perform for several moves ahead.
it is also the case of a composer who is able to put together a symphony with multiple instruments and sounds and, uh, be f and forethink how they will mix together and the harmony created by the ensemble. The second, so that's for the epistemological view. The second aspect touches the relation between phronesis and poesis. This uh, relation departs from the traditional differentiation proposed by Aristotle between these concepts as it suggests complementarities between these rational capabilities rather than a disjunction. Several contemporary thinkers, uh, including McIntyre and Martha Nussbaum, have explored this idea. John Wall, in his article about this subject, explores the different approaches from Aristotle to Hikur. One of his conclusions seems very suggestive to our inquiry. He says, I quote, Phronesis begins in history, but its poetic task is to interpret history in new directions, capable of creatively account for otherness. Besides the inclusion of otherness related to the ethical aspect to which we shall return in a moment, Wall's analysis stresses the poetical creativity tied to phronesis as there is no pre-made responsible available to particular ethical demands. As Hikur highlights, the action is tragic because just demands can be conflicting. The phronimus is called upon to deliberate exactly because there was no simple and clear possible narratives to transform the existing situation into a good narrative. The point B of the frenetical narrative is the point in which an aporia seems to threat the frenetical narrative with an undesirable end, with an end that does not promote the good life. The deliberative task is to find not yet explored alternatives to extend the frenetical narrative, and that's an intense task of creative imagination. What seems especially important interesting about this approach is that it's, it shows the kind of poetical semantic innovation in the ethical discourse that not only proposes new senses, but also has to mix in itself everything that was said in the retrospective narrative. It's not simply a creation ex nihilo, but it's an innovation that is constrained by narratives and moral principles that demand to be taken into account in order to reach a meaningful concordant discordant as an ever open-ended, broader, frenetical narrative. Along with creative imagination, there is also another important aspect to be explored of the liberation that is connected to its ethical dim dimension. The Phronimus is recognized as such not only because he narrates well, but also because he's committed to do his best effort to make the prospective narrative a reality. Saying and doing shall be really tired when it comes to deliberation. As in a promise, the speaker is not only uttering an affirmation, but he is committing himself to make his best to help turning that frenetical narrative into real actions. As we touch the speech acts theory, we shall briefly remind Hikur's remarks about its relation to selfhood. Hikur highlights the contribution of speech acts to make clear the I and the you behind these statements, which sheds light to the complex situations of interlocution involved in speech acts. It also shows that, I quote him, every advance made in the direction of selfhood of the speaker or the agent has its appropriate counterpart as a comparable advance in the otherness of the partner. He even suggests the concept of interlocutionary act to stress the fact that every speech act points to others, towards otherness. It implicitly means that even on explicit assertions, there is an expe uh, expectation of an ag agreement from the other. There is certainly a difference between promise uttered in the first person and the deliberation that is effect, that may affect and may be dependent on other people, on other persons' actions. Nevertheless, instead of the I promise I will do this, if we try to make an explicit, if we try to make explicit the elocutionary act of deliberation, we may say something like, I commit myself to turn this deliberation into a reality. It means that the task of the phronimus does not end with the deliberation and 
the respective decision. The Phronimus is not an oracle. He does not know the future. He suggests a possible future narrative and works the best he can to make that happen. His task is not simply narrating, but he's reaffirming each day his deliberation by following up his decision, acting as he may. He was supposed to act, act and doing his best to make sure others implied and committed to the prospective narrative are doing so. As an example, since last year, Brazil has been experiencing a very interesting judicial trial involving a large number of high-ranked politicians involved with a government at the time. Due to a large number of very important people involved, the consensus was that the trial would lead to nothing. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court, led by its president, Joaquim Barbosa, was able to investigate and judge all defendants, including the sidekick of the ex-president. It was an astounding practice of frenetical narratives. The trial was followed daily by hundreds of thousands of as retrospective narratives of how the sophisticated corruption mechanisms were being told and rectified by each new thread of narrative. The sentence, the perspective narrative, was uttered to propose an extension of the plot in a way that the stolen mon money, as part of or part of it, would be returned to the proper owners, which means basically myself and Brazilians. Uh, and uh, the convicted uh, politics would be banished from public affairs in order to avoid further crimes. Unfortunately, more than one year after the decision, due to several political and legal maneuvers, only a few convictions were actually turned into reality. But still, the Supreme Court is ap apparently actively working to make his deliberation happen. This case also highlights the fragility of deliberation as it involves not only the person or community who deliberates, but also it involves actions of others. So the locutionary force of deliberation seems to have indeed some similarities with the locutionary force of promising. Nevertheless, it may be even more fragile as it typically proposes actions that are not to believe it, that are to believe it by others. It may lead us to recognize another important aspect of the frenetical deliberation that we may call the frenetical aspiration. When the phronimus deliberates at point B, he, is, he has an aspiration to promote the good life for all people involved in the plot. In many cases, he's actually recognized as phronimus by the community because his past deliberations led to decisions that promoted actions and relationships that were perceived by the community as just and good. The Phronimus aspires to propose a continuation for the frenetical narrative that is able to take from point B, where the nonsense and the discordance seems to prevail, to a point C, where the frenetical narrative shows some concordance and is sensible. As mentioned above, it goes along with the challenge that the deliberative perspective narrative never starts from scratch. It is a composition that has already been started by actions and events, by doings and sufferings. The perspective narrative has to incorporate the story from point A to B. It has to integrate the constraints and limitations to a reasonable and factual possible perspective narrative. Not only, only that, not only that, but there are also two other main narrative threads that constrain the possibilities of the perspective narrative. As we mentioned, the ethos and the legal spheres are also to be considered. But the phronimus aspiration alone may not be enough. Phronetical aspiration is mainly connected to the persons involved in the perspective narrative, who may be not only the phronimus himself. One of the tasks of the phronimus is, by promoting a good deliberation is to propose a decision that can trigger this frenetical aspiration in all involved parts. This aspiration lies at the heart of the ethical intention. There shall be a will to live a good life together by taking part in constructing this frenetical narrative that will take the community to the desired point C in the future. So the phronimus aspiration shall be also inspirational. In case of decisions that shall be turned into action, not only the phronimus himself the perspective configuration only turns into reality if the living characters, the readers of the decision, who shall take part and act in real life, 
are able to refigure themselves based on the proposal for an ethical narrative. Decision is therefore the fruit of deliberation in the form of suggested phrenetical narrative. The effect of such phrenetical narrative is dependent on the refiguration of the involved people based on the decision suggested by the phronimus. In terms of speech acts, there is a theory we may be invited to think about the relations between the elocutionary and perlocutionary forces of deliberation. One important remark at this point is that one could always remember that in practical terms, the society typically has mechanisms to make sure deliberation turns into reality by the use of force. The tribunal deliberates and the law enforcement entity is normally assigned to make sure that the everyone involved in the sentence will act according to what has been deliberated. That is certainly true, but what we are looking for is something more original than law, as Ricoeur suggests. We are assuming that the first hypothesis of Ricoeur's little ethics is correct and the ethical aim shall precede the norm when it comes to deliberations. But we also recognize the need for the ontological mediation. Because there is evil and violence, deliberation also needs to be uh, thought in a broader context. It has to be taken into account the norm, the moral principles, but it cannot stop there as well. As deliberation is about particular situations, the norm and the universal laws are not enough, as we know. And in that sense, the narrative model seems to aid on the understanding of deliberation as an implotment which, with such a variety of competing sources, demands, and also narrative constraints imposed by moral principles. We also agree with Ricoeur in the third part of his ethics that real deliberation is related to a practical wisdom matured by the recognition of evil and violence. A practical wisdom that incorporates the deontological moment, but that is also capable of going beyond its limitation by proposing a perspective narrative which offers an altern alternate path to dilemmas attached to several levels of tragic of actions by means of productive imagination and the aspiration of a good life in common. And when we is expand the limits of deliberation beyond the simple execution of decisions by the use of inst institutionalized force, we not only regain the original perspective of the will to be the good life within communities united as, by a certain ethos, but we also may find even more interesting the role of the phronimus. His decision is effective because it has a perlocutionary force different from other utterances. And there is given, and that's given by the recognition from the community that he is able to provide decisions that promote the good life. For doing so, all elements of retrospective and perspective narratives play an important role. The possible relation between elocution, perlocution, and recognition in the frenetical narrative seems a promised topic, topic of investigation. Before concluding these remarks, we may need to consider two major difficulties of this model of deliberation as phronetical narrative. Firstly, if it's true that the phronimus aspires to propose a perspective narrative that is good, as mentioned in his uh, words, shall uh, have different elocutionary force. It implies that the Phronimus is not only a good storyteller or rhetoric, but that he really aspires for and he's committed to his decisions, to the prospective narrative. He's committed to take part of the frenetical narrative, even if not as a protagonist in action. The chair of a bioethical committee may, not be, may, may be someone different from the nurse applying the medical care deliberated by the committee, but he still he has to be committed to support the deliberation taking. He has to understand the challenges of the applicability. And he also needs to be committed to act and suggest adjustments if he notices that the course of perspective narrative is diverting from the proposition made at point B. It suggests much, a much more fluid process in which perspective narrative is constantly being reevaluated and sometimes reproposed. Secondly, another possible difficulty that may have accompanied us during this reflection is related to an aspect of Phronimus that Hikar already pointed out. The Phronimus does not need to be a single person alone 
It is related to the approximation Hecker suggests uh, between the practical wisdom and the Hegelian Zitlichkeit, parallel to the relation between deliberation and public discussions. Hecker suggests a humble Zitlichkeit, but one that points to the effectuation of practical wisdom within institutional contexts. As we may consider the spectrum of situations in which a frenetical deliberation may be applied, we shall also consider the possible collective nature of the fronimus. So to conclude, we have suggested throughout this paper three connections with a sole hope that the, after these remarks they may sound at least plausible. The first connection is between frenetical deliberation and narrativity. The model of the threefold mimesis seems a rich source for exploring other aspects of phronesis and especially of how the phronimus acts. To well deliberate involves a capacity of configuring good retrospective and prospective frenetical narratives, and this configuration is tightly related to the prefiguration of life and the capacity to constantly refigure oneself. The second liaison is between deliberation and aspiration. As we look at the deliberation like a form of frenetical narrative, we find the aspiration outside of the Phronimus activity. The Phronimus proposes a perspective narrative because he aspires that the long-term narrative of an ethical community may promote the good life. He aspires to find a discordant concordance, a sense to the living plot by proposing a frenetical narrative that is capable of refiguring the community life. This aspirational aspect also highlights the innovative aspect of the frenetical deliberation. The aspiration is tied to productive imagination, to what is not yet, to new possible configurations, to a deep belief that men are capable to build together new forms of living in a constantly new environment marked by the tragedy of life. At last, we also briefly touched the possible relation between deliberation and promise by looking at them from the linguistic perspective, especially the speech acts theory. The aspirational aspect of deliberation demands a response from the Phronimus by his commitment to do his best to turn his decision into reality. Being a Phronimus is not being a poet, as he is not proposing any kind of perspective narrative, but a phronetical one. It implies a different elocutionary force of deliberation closer to the locutionary force of a promise, as it suggests for a commitment to others involved in the frenetical decision, a commitment that goes beyond the decision utterance and extends itself by the entire and potentially endless perspective narrative of a given community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bien, nous avons commencé avec euh, retard, donc on va prendre quand même cinq minutes de, de discussion. Euh, je suis euh, désolé parce que je ne suis pas, je réalisais en écoutant Fernando que je ne suis pas assez anglophone euh, pour moi-même poser mes propres questions euh, en anglais. J'ai beaucoup de questions. Ce sera des conversations qui prendront le temps. Les conversations philosophiques prennent du temps, souvent. On a du temps. Euh, bah, enfin, je, vraiment, je le remercie vivement pour cette euh, entre là extrêmement subtil d'un Aristote qui n'est pas euh, qui est un Aristote très anglo-saxon justement une conception et en même temps de cette conception de la pour la phronésie c'est en même temps cette mimesis cette, cette poétique cette mimesis euh, tellement euh, cet entre là tellement rien euh, je me rappelle des débats de conversation entre Ricoeur et Jean-Marc Ferry justement dans lesquels c'est une autre question peut-être apparemment mais Ricoeur protestait contre la manière un peu positiviste dont Jean-Marc Ferry est âgé. Il y avait l'étage euh, euh, traditionnel, narratif, argumentatif, etc., comme vraiment séparé. Et Ricard disait, mais non, mais on a toujours besoin de, de, de dépenser ensemble, davantage ensemble. C'est juste une, une remarque. Alors, j'ouvre euh, le débat, les questions. Grand salon. Uh, yes. Okay. Very fast. Thank you, Fernando. I think it was uh, a very good talk, very inspiring. I love the way you used, you know, productive imagination and the way you developed uh, you know, Jordan's hint at the perspective uh, narrative, also to refigure our, our 
will to live together on a common political life. I know this is not exactly uh, what you were talking about, but I, I just wondered uh, what happens when we have a competition between different stories, each one wanting to be this story that will refigure our perspective identity. You know, let's say, let's imagine the possibility of a conflict of interpretations applied to our social and political life. How do we find the best criteria to distinguish between what is the frenetic narrative, so what's the best one that will better suit our perspective identity and our will to live together? What do you think about this? Yeah, that, the, thank you for the question. That, that was one of the, the questions that uh, uh, led me to think about the, the relation with narrative. Because uh, at most cases, there are competing threads that uh, need to be put together in order to create the decision. Right? So the kind of frenetical intelligence that's required is exactly to understand behind those competing, which is, which is very good, by the way, to have them. Hiker, as I mentioned, Hiker thinks that it's a requirement. We need to have this conflict in order to get to thoughtful convictions. But the, the basic criteria, as it seems, is the aim at the good life, at the eudaimonia. So the good is always what matters. And the competence behind putting, to, behind putting together those threads is a kind of narrative comp competence. That's, that's the idea. No, it was your... Yes, I have a very oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I thought I do want to say that I very much enjoyed the first paper. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And you referred repeatedly to concordance coming out of discordance. And my question is, to what extent uh, concordance is what other papers of the liberation would refer to as a census? And, um, and if it is consensus, to what extent does this make Ricoeur's conception vulnerable to the same kinds of criticism that has been ch uh, charged against, for example, even Habermas? Because, yes, it's true that you want to have conflicting stories and that you want to see what they have in common and how at some point they will reach this level of, of concordance. <coughs> and it's true that the notion of narrative closure drives this concordance. But how do we know that ultimately the one that wins over or whatever comes together is not going to be pushed by certain criteria which are very much exclusionary criteria as it's been argued against Habermas as a concept. So the question for me is, is there anything in Ricoeur beyond that narrative comprehension that makes his model truly more democratic and truly more ecumenical? Well, uh do, do you want to take more questions? No, there's two other questions, okay. and after, um, I think it's finished. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no uh, I, I believe that uh, the one thing, one differentiation is that uh, when we talk about concordance, we are talking about the narrative concordance. It's not about a concordance between the people involved on the complaints. You know, we are trying to make sense out of the story that leads to the good life within that community. So there, there is an anchor on the objectivity of that community. So the concordance is not a concordance among the, the writers, but it's a concordance of the story itself. So I, I would say that that would be a, a first thought that could be explored further. but. Uh, uh, I, I do believe that the, this differentiation is, is fundamental to, to understand. Marie? Um, I agree with your goals, um, such as new encounters with other traditions, uh, new symbolic order, transformation of identity, but I'm wondering about your thought forms, whether they allow for that, because they seem to be really communitarian. Um, and my test case is, how do you get the dimension of legality into your system? Because clearly, a uh, community doesn't need it. They have their internal ethos that binds them. Legality is a really uh, kind of concept of the right. You don't have to internally agree. Legitimacy means you have to <coughs> internally agree. You only have to externally conform. And that's a condition of freedom. You, you can't be forced to think like the rest of the community. 
So legality is a really universalist concept. I, I don't know how you can bring that into your um, composition, and I think you need it, because uh, if you want to go beyond the existing ethos, you need it. Yeah, well, basically, I'm, I'm glad that you make this question because Hiker, I believe Hiker answered for me a while. <laughs> uh, the way he puts his little ethics, is it, uh, uh, isn't it like becoming with the ethical aim, with, with uh, 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 as he called, a nebulous view of the good life, which is by itself a communitarian uh, point of depart? And then he integrates in chapter 8 of the, his little ethics, the deontological moment, which leads to aphorias. And so I am proposing to have the same kind of integration into the narrative, narrative frenetical deliberation. Because we start by looking in the aim of the good life. But there is a limit, there is a constraint to what can be said. And that's the way we integrate the rule and the norms. And then this may lead to non-factual situations when there are competing just requirements that requires innovation in productive imagination. And last question, Tomei. Thanks. Man, I really enjoyed how uh, you sort of broadened the practical syllogism and mapped on the uh, three moments of my thesis compared to the three points in the practical syllogism. My question is a little bit devious, and it has to do with the history of philosophy, because the emphasis you put on the front of us actually lays your argument open to the same charge as Aristotle with his defense of natural slavery and how slaves are those who lack the intellectual virtue of Hermesis. Within, the way, within your narrative model, Strawson's claim becomes quite valid because it excludes those people who claim to be merely episodic and think non-diachronically. So do you have a response to that challenge? Yeah. Uh, in, uh Thank you for the question. Uh, and one of the points is that uh, the, I, I call the frenetical attentiveness, which is a concept that I tend to put together with solicitude, as Ricoeur does. And solicitude is the capacity of creating this equality out of an inequality situation, out of a different situation, to bring together the view of someone who is speechless due to a a certain uh, situation in, in the community spectrum. So I believe that this frenetical attentiveness shall become as close as possible to what Hikura refers as solicitude to make sure that all voices are integrated into the narrative, narrative plot. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>